Um, we're good, Susan. All right, are we live? We're live. All right. Good afternoon and welcome to Facebook Live Bay Area Legal Services and the Judge Don Castor Community Law Center at Bay Area Legal Services. We are a project of the Volunteer Lawyers Program. Today, we decided it would be very important for us to share with you some information about helping small businesses who are trying to reopen and recover from COVID-19. So welcome and um, just wanna tell you a little bit about the services. We have, um, we have a number of people here with us today to share with you their thoughts and provide valuable information. Um, one of the topics is um, uh, commercial leases. The other is um, opportunities for bankruptcy if that's something you are in need of. We also have um, Congresswoman Kathy Castor available and she's going to say a few words to us. The um, Judge Don Castor Community Law Center provides uh, free nonprofit and small business legal services to eligible individuals and, and nonprofit charities in the Tampa Bay area. We also work directly with a, a wonderful group called the Florida Community Development Legal Project. The Florida Community Development Legal Project is a uh, statewide program funded in part by the Florida Bar Foundation that allows us to bring these same resources statewide through five different or legal aid organizations, which include Bay Area Legal Services, Community Legal Services of Mid Florida, Jacksonville Area Legal Aid, the Legal Aid of Broward County, Legal Services of Greater Miami, and Legal Services of North Florida. Uh, later on in the program, you're going to see our links to our Facebooks, to our um, websites, where you as small businesses or nonprofit charities can apply to get legal help, to get legal advice. Um, you're also going to see some wonderful links that we have on all of our websites to uh, COVID-19 resources. And I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you that we do have a special hotline that you can apply to get some legal advice if you're a small business. And um, that would be on all of our websites, but especially on the Florida Community Development Legal Project website. So look for those resources and um, hopefully you'll be able to get the answers that you need. If we are able to provide assistance to you and we do have limited um, ability to provide staff assistance, uh, we would love to hear you and help, help you um, through your legal needs and your legal questions. We, um, we also are working with a group, a national group, Exponentum, which is made up of 15 legal services organizations around the country that provide business law legal assistance and they are providing some very valuable trainings. So look forward to looking on our website, at Bay Area's website, and um, we will be posting those free trainings that you can watch on the web in the convenience of wherever you feel comfortable and safe while you are trying to recover and get back to the business world. So um, with that, I would like to start off by uh, introducing Susan Paul? Susan just accidentally went on mute. We'll just need you to unmute Susan. Okay, hold on one second. I apologize to everyone for all of this technology that I'm trying to deal with. So let me start again. US, Kathy, US Representative Kathy Castor is in the Tampa Bay, is in Tampa Bay's US con uh, Congress. Her district, which includes all of Tampa and parts of Hillsborough County, is a community of small business and businesses. And Kathy and Representative Castor works hard to capture federal funding to jumpstart and assist our small business community and frequently meets with local small business owners throughout the community. So Representative Castor, thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you, Susan, and to everyone at Bay Area Legal Services and everyone uh, 
who's joined us today. This is a very important event for our local small business owners and all of our nonprofit organizations that are the lifeblood of, of making the Tampa Bay area special and making sure families uh, stay afloat through, through the pandemic. And I wanna thank uh, Tom DeFiori, especially at Barrier Legal Services, who's been a partner of mine in uh, aiding a lot of our small business owners and others. We're so fortunate to have the premier legal aid organization, Bay Area Legal Services in our community. And I'm very humbled to join you as part of the Judge Don Castor uh, Legal Center. Uh, Don Castor was my father. Uh, he passed away in 2013, seven years ago, but he was born here in Tampa, 1931 in Tampa General Hospital, grew up in Seminole Heights, went off to law school and was the first executive director of Bay Area Legal Services when it, when it started many years ago. And then he went on to serve on the county court bench. Uh, he was renowned for ensuring that no matter who appeared in his courtroom, they had their day in court, they were heard and received justice. Uh, much, much to the consternation of some of the high powered attorneys who thought they could get in there and soak up all the time. Uh, but I wanna thank Scott Stichter and, and Shari Mani too for, for being on to provide uh, aid here. My, I remember as a little girl, my father uh, was very interested in helping to build the nonprofit community here in Tampa. He was uh, uh, an early organizer of the Spring of Tampa Bay and Metropolitan Ministries when churches came together to organize Metropolitan Ministries. And uh, he would be so proud of all the work, Susan, that you're doing and that's going on in Bay Area. And then all across this community. So we're in a very difficult situation with this public health crisis and the economic fallout. Uh, it's not lost on me. That's why I fought to obtain every dollar I could under the CARES Act to come back here to the Tampa Bay area to make sure that families and our small businesses and the nonprofit agencies can stay afloat and uh, we got to continue this. Some of these funding streams are, are difficult, uh, but, but there is help. And I really want to encourage everyone to reach out. The CARES Act, of course, was that pot of money that also provided $1,200 direct payments or stimulus payments uh, to individuals, uh, provided emergency aid to Hillsborough County where individuals can go and families can get help with rental assistance, uh, provided emergency aid to feeding Tampa Bay that a lot of families have taken advantage of. Uh, and Hillsborough County Public Schools received millions of dollars to help with uh, the e-learning, the computer and technology and uh, nutritious meals to, to students. But it also contained that very important pot of money for paycheck protection program where small business owners could get a forgivable loan. Uh, and uh, we're hoping to re-up that pot of money soon. It also contains important help through the Small Business Administration, emergency disaster loans uh, and other loans that if you haven't looked into them, but now your business situation has changed entirely, a lot of those funds are still available to assist you. So you'll hear more about that today, but I want to make sure that you all know that I'm your partner. On my website, I have a resource guide at caster.house.gov. Uh, check it out. It, we run the gamut from health services to social services and the like, but I want you to be in touch directly if you need any assistance with the IRS, with Medicare, with the Small Business Administration. Uh, your VA benefits. That's why we're here and we're a proactive office and I have the best constituent service team in the business. So do not hesitate to reach out. And just know we're fighting now for the next emergency aid package called the HEROES Act. The House passed it in May. They're negotiating. It provides another round of those stimulus checks, those direct cash payments of $1,200, more unemployment aid, more for small business owners, so stay tuned, we're, we're just, we're, we want to be 
uh, a lifeline to you to, so that we can get through this. And it also has important resources to control the virus so we can get back to normal. But uh, Susan, thank you very much for allowing me to, uh, to weigh in this morning and to all of our neighbors out there, just hang in there and, and please do not hesitate to reach out. Thanks. Thank you, Representative Castor. I appreciate you and we've tapped into you many times for your help. And um, I do want you to know that um, we appreciate all the resources that you're offering and the hard work you're doing for our community. So um, thank you. And um, so I, 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 I encourage you to visit her website to see the resources she is offering. And, um, and then I wanna share with you some of the other resources that we're offering both on our website and as I said, on the Florida Community Development Legal Project website. So now what I'd like to do is turn to our uh, next speaker, who's gonna bring you some very valuable information on commercial leases that I know that you're gonna wanna hear. Her name is Sharzad Imami. She is the founder and director of the Florida Community Development Legal Project. She is also the director of the Affordable Housing and Community Development Practice Group at Legal Services of Greater Miami. Sharzad provides uh, practices, focuses on um, representing the nonprofit developers and organizations that are developing and preserving affordable housing and community-based facilities. She runs the Florida Community Development Legal Project. I'll call her boss. And Sharzad, if you wanna take over from here, thank you for being here today. Of course, thanks, Susan. Well, it's a true collaboration. Um, Susan and Bay Area Legal Services, they are wonderful partners and we're so happy to have them as a part of the Florida Community Development Legal Project. Um, we do serve the entire state of Florida through our partnerships, such as our partnership with Bay Area Legal Services. So thank you so much, Susan. Um, so what we're going to go through uh, right now um, is a little primer on, on uh, small businesses and commercial evictions. Um, and this is really just a general overview. Um, you know, we're providing some educational materials for you to use as a small business owner uh, if you're dealing with this, with this issue. Um, of course, as always, you know, this is, this is not legal, legal advice and, um, you know, you are urged to uh, reach out to an attorney if you are experiencing issues with a commercial eviction. But hopefully this will give you enough information um, so that you can, you can better equip yourself as a small business owner as to how to deal with a landlord issue or a, a, a impending eviction or a three day notice or, or anything of that sort. And if you do need assistance, please go to our website. It's www dot fl community development dot org you'll see it there at the bottom of the page um, if you click on our website you can click on uh, get help um, or apply for services and we have two ways you can apply if you think that you might just need a 30 to 45 minute uh, co free consultation on a COVID-19 related matter there is a link that you click you fill out the information and we pair you with an attorney that will provide a 45 minute free consultation on a COVID-19 related matter. If you think that your issue is more of an extended representation matter, something that you really do need to speak to an attorney about and, and receive ongoing assistance, we have another link on our website for that. So please, I urge you to visit our website if you need assistance. Our services are available to eligible small businesses Generally, that means that if you are a small business owner who is low to moderate income, you would be eligible for our services. Or if you are a nonprofit organization, uh, you would also potentially be eligible for our services. So you'll see here on the introduction page, it explains who we are. Um, we are uh, basically a partnership of legal aid organizations throughout the entire state of Florida. So we serve the entire state. Um, our clients are listed there, nonprofits and small businesses, and some of our service areas. So I urge you to um, go ahead and visit the website if you want more information. So you can go to the next slide. And 
There we go. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about commercial leases. So it's very important to know your rights as a commercial tenant. Um, if a landlord uh, in Florida wishes to uh, give you notice for non-payment of rent, uh, there is this, a specialized process, a, a process that is governed by Florida statute that they must follow. So they have to serve you, your business, with written notice stating that your rent is past due. Uh, the notice must be in writing. It has to be delivered to your place of business. If you are not present, your landlord can leave a copy of the notice. After receiving this notice, you have three days to pay the rent that is owed or to vacate. Uh, if you believe that the rent is not owed, then you, your landlord, after three days goes by and you have not paid your rent, they must file a complaint for eviction. So you will receive a complaint for eviction. That's the next step. And uh, after you receive your complaint for eviction, it is very important to note that you have five days to respond to that, that complaint. So you must file an answer with the court. You must um, put into the court registry any back rent that is due. Um, so we, we call that depositing money into the registry of the court. This is very important because in order for your case to move forward and for the case not to be dismissed, you need to deposit the rent that is owed into the registry of the court. When you file your answer, you can also assert defenses. Um, usually after you file your answer, the, these cases are set for mediation or a hearing. If you fail to file an answer, your landlord um, can file a motion for default. If the motion for default is not responded to, so if you do not respond to the motion for default, they will then file a motion for final judgment for eviction. Once the final judgment for eviction is granted, the clerk then will be directed to sign a writ of possession. That writ of possession allows a sheriff to post a 24 hour notice to your place of business. Um, they usually, they will post it on the door of the business. Um, and then of course you have 24 hours to, to vacate, but your landlord must follow this entire process if they wish to evict you. And as long as you file an answer, and put your money into the court registry after the eviction is filed, um, you can then go to the court, you can go uh, to the mediation or a hearing, whichever one is scheduled, and assert your defenses. And so that, that is our recommendation during this time that you absolutely need to file that answer and make sure you deposit your money so that you are ensuring uh, your day in court against the landlord. Now, things that a landlord cannot do this is governed by Florida statute, chapter 83-67. They cannot cause your utilities to stop operating. So they can't shut your water off or your lights or your gas or the elevator service or the garbage service in order to get you out. That is illegal. They can't prevent access to your business. So they can't go in and just change your locks. That is illegal. They can't remove your property unless your lease has been properly terminated. Uh, through the eviction process. Or of course, if you vacated voluntarily, then they could remove your property and they cannot harass you. Um, so if your landlord does any of these things, for example, if they change your locks, you do have the right to sue for damages or three months rent and your costs and attorney's fees. Um, what we always advise commercial tenants to do is to become very familiar with your lease. Uh, commercial leases are, are different than residential leases in Florida in that uh, really commercial leases are highly negotiated. So uh, what is in a commercial lease um, really is going to govern your tenancy uh, much more than in the residential context. Every commercial lease is different. So the language of each, each lease is going to vary. So it's very important that you are aware of all the provisions in your lease. And if you're not, to please have an attorney review your lease to determine what remedies, if any, are available to you during this time if you are unable to pay your rent. 
some provisions that you might want to look at closely. Uh, any force majeure provisions. What does this mean? It, normally, force majeure clauses excuse a party's non-performance uh, when any kind of unforeseen circumstances come up, which are outside the party's control, like uh, you know, a hurricane, an act of God, um, uh, you know, some kind of um, some kind of reason beyond your control that you can't pay your rent, such as a pandemic. Now, uh, of course, pandemics were not contemplated uh, when most of these leases were drafted, so the actual pandemic language is probably not going to be in there. But it's it's a good argument that you can make in an eviction context. Um, you know, you can say that this, this, this is a force majeure event. It was an unforeseen circumstance. Um, typically, force majeure clauses do not waive a tenant's obligation to pay what rent is owed, but it does provide you with a negotiating point and a defense. Um, the other thing that many leases contain is a rent abatement clause, um, specifying that if you are unable to access or occupy your premises, then you are entitled to reduce rent or termination of the lease. Um, another provision that you might want to look at is the quiet enjoyment provision. This, uh, in general, means that your tenants, that your occupation and use of the premises must not be disturbed or interrupted. Um, so, if that is happening and your landlord is causing that, that would be a breach under the lease. Um, it is. It is also uh, possible that you may have what we call common law defenses. So these uh, would be available to tenants as well, such as impossibility of performance. Uh, you know, you have to show that the performance of the lease is rendered objectively impossible as a result of an unforeseen event, such as uh, what we're experiencing now with the, with the pandemic. Um, another possible defense would be frustration of purpose. Uh, you have to show that the qualifying event was reasonably unforeseen at the time the contract was formed and that the event substantially frustrated the principal purpose for which the agreement was entered into. Um, so you do have uh, options as a tenant uh, in an eviction uh, situation, or even if you're just at the point in time where there hasn't been an eviction filed, but you want to negotiate something with your landlord, um, you do have, um, you do have um, talking points and, and things to bring up. But again, you'll need to look at your lease and see what's contained in your lease agreement. Many small businesses had uh, business interruption insurance. Uh, before the pandemic, uh, before the pandemic hit, and business interruption coverage is designed to compensate you as an owner for lost revenue from forced or unforeseen closure. Um, a lot of insurance companies are denying uh, coverage uh, because of COVID nineteen. They're saying that it is an exclusion; it's not covered as a part of the policy. Some insurance companies are covering it. Um, again, if you are having difficulty with this, you should consult with an attorney and see what your available options are. They would need to read your insurance policy uh, and, and figure out how to go about helping you appropriately. And then the other thing that I will say, if you can go to the next slide, is that it's very important even before uh, the, the threat of eviction comes up from your landlord, to reach out to your landlord and explain to them that you are not able to pay your rent and the reasons why and see if they will negotiate something with you. Um, we have been fairly successful with some of our clients in negotiating with landlords. Um, you know, sometimes they will create payment plans for you um, for rent that is owed. Um, a plan that you can pay your rent sometime in the future when you get your business back up and running. Um, sometimes they will convert unused tenant improvement funds uh, into rent abatements for you. Uh, oftentimes you can negotiate extending your lease in exchange for reduce, reduced rents. So for example, adding an additional three or six months on at the end of your lease and saying that you'll be able to pay at that point. Um, and some landlords have even agreed to allow tenants to pay 50% of their rent uh, for a certain period of time, 30, 60, 90, 120 days. 
uh, or just defer the rent altogether. So it is, it is worth reaching out to your landlord and seeing what you can negotiate. Um, I will go to the next and final slide. And then I would just say thinking ahead, now that we, we know that, that, this is, uh, that this is a possibility and these types of, of pandemics and crises are you know, entirely possible at this point, we are trying to look into the future. Um, and so when you enter into a new lease in the future, you might wanna think about shorter lease terms or uh, how you can get out of the lease, you know, early termination clauses, um, ability to cancel the lease, you know, adding pandemics as a part of a force majeure clause, um, and then interruption of services clauses in leases. So, you know, in the event of building closures, limitations of services that the landlord's going to provide, um, you know, whether that's imposed by the government or by the landlord or tenant's best practices, you as a tenant should build into your le lease rent relief in the event that something like this happens into the future. So that's just a brief overview. Uh, I hope that that's provided some useful information for you as small business owners or nonprofits to use during this time. Uh, and if you would like more information, we have more information on our website, floridacommunitydevelopment.org. And you can also apply there if you uh, are seeking legal assistance. So thank you. So um, now I guess it's time for us to ask Paul, is there any questions that anyone has about this presentation and their leases? Yes, we did have a question, Susan and Shar. Someone asked, can a landlord inform you to leave because they have chosen to sell the property? So that's sort of a, a general question and without the details, I don't know the answer to that. Um, oftentimes, if a landlord enters into a contract for the sale of the property, um, it depends on what is in your individual lease agreement. So sometimes lease agreements will say that if a landlord enters into a sale of the property that they can, that they can terminate your lease. Uh, and that oftentimes will be within your lease agreement. So you have to look at your particular lease agreement have an attorney review it for you to see if that is built into the lease agreement. Okay, so are there any other questions, Paul? That was the only question at this time, Susan. All right, so if you have those kinds of questions and you are a small business, I encourage you to go to our website and apply for assistance or to look even for some additional answers that might be posted there or handouts. And, and Paul, if you'll switch to the next screen, I think you, there you go. This handout for small, for small businesses, a commercial lease handout is available on the Florida Community Development Legal um, Project website. And it gives a lot more information, uh, that things that Char has talked about and other um, information is available. So please make this, uh, resource available to yourselves. It's free and it's available whenever you need it. So um, thank you, Shar. Um, I appreciate your participation today. And uh, as, as a partner in the Florida Community Development Legal Project, I feel um, blessed to be able to say that we have these resources available for the state of Florida. And now I'm going to turn to our next speaker. And this is a, a topic that I think is, is going to be very important for those who need it. And um, I'm hopeful that you don't, but if you do, um, this is, uh, I wanna introduce our, our uh, volunteer attorney, a very wonderful volunteer attorney who's been volunteering, I believe for almost his entire legal career. Uh, his name is Scott Stichter. He's with the law firm of Stichter, Rydell, Blaine and, and Postler. Uh, Scott is a partner and he specializes representing parties in distressed financially distressed transactions with an emphasis on representing borrowers in chapter 11 proceedings. Scott's going to bring, uh, introduce you today to topics such as chapter 11 bankruptcy and the new subchapter five, which was created as part of the CARES Act. So Scott, if you'll take it from here. Thank you. 
Uh, what I'm going to do is just give people a brief overview of how do we determine whether somebody is a viable candidate for bankruptcy? What are options? Uh, if they are a viable candidate for bankruptcy, what, what can a Chapter 11 or a Subchapter 5 case do? Uh, and the treatment of claims. When I initially meet with somebody uh, to discuss bankruptcies, I'm trying to get a handle on how the business is doing. I'd like to gen open, ask open-ended questions, asking them sort of what has caused the problem? What are those business issues that that keep the owner up at night? What are those bills that they are struggling to pay? What you're trying to do is determine whether this company can get to a point with the existence of the protections of the bankruptcy code that would allow it to stabilize operations and begin operating profitably so that it can propose a plan that uh, that will be able to pay creditors. So one of the concerns the bankruptcy court has is you have entities that owe money to people before they file, and the bankruptcy code is on guard to prevent another group of creditors, those creditors who extend credit post-petition, from being in a position where they are not paid. So I like to see, uh, you generally ask me questions, if you could put all your back debts on hold for a while, does the company generate enough money to pay its bills? Those ongoing necessary, pay your rent, pay your employees, uh, purchase goods that are necessary for operations. One of the problems after filing, most people are going to be put on COD. So they're going to have to be able to pay bills as they come due uh, from existing cash. So if the answer, if they are unable to generate enough money to pay their debts, it's going to be a very difficult bankruptcy because while bankruptcy can cure some problems, it doesn't have the ability of being able to make revenues match expenses. If a bankruptcy is not viable for an entity, there are a couple of options. Under the Florida statutes, a, bank, a company can go through a voluntary liquidation, which really has two components. And you can look at 607, Point one four zero two of the Florida statutes. There's one part about getting board approval, shareholder approval. And then there's also a separate provision that requires notice to creditors uh, and dealing with creditor claims. For the most part, I found for small businesses that can't operate, this is a, it is a expensive and burdensome, uh, burdensome uh, process to go through. And I've actually found it be more expensive sometimes to do it correctly than it, it, it would be to file a chapter seven. There are judicial, there's basis for judicial dissolution, but those are very rare. Those deal with fraud, those deal, uh, you don't see it very often, two party disputes. What I generally advise people who are who have companies that can't pay debts is there's also the administrative dissolution. That is a company that fails to pay, to pay its annual fees, file its annual reports, would be administratively dissolved from the state. Sometimes I've advised people in those to couple that with a sort of an informal notice procedure, write people letters and tell them you're out of business. Uh, this, this doesn't mean people can't sue, sue the company. Uh, but again, it is a step you can see to see whether you may, if, if creditor pressure is too much, 
whether you you can avoid you can avoid a chapter seven. Uh, but if you close the doors, send out letters, and there is creditor activity, uh, this is this is something at later at a later stage you can file a chapter seven, which is a federal court proceeding under the bankruptcy court supervision where a trustee is appointed to liquidate the assets of the company. The other option uh, in some instances is a, an assignment for the benefit of creditors, which is effectively a state court bankruptcy. In that case, an assignee is selected to liquidate the assets of, of, it, of the company. Generally, an assignment for the benefit of creditors is used if there's an intent to sell the business or sell assets to the business, and it is determined that a chapter a sale in Chapter 11 is too expensive. So let's assume the client has a business that has experienced a blip, experienced some short term, or needs time to implement a restructuring. A Chapter 11 can be filed. A Chapter 11 is a reorganization. It allows existing ownership to remain in possession uh, and operate their business while they restructure, while they attempt to fix the business or take steps to improve cash flow or reduce expenses. The, they do this while they get the benefit of the automatic stay. The automatic stay prevents actions subject to certain exceptions, primarily governmental powers to, to enforce police, police or regulatory efforts. It prevents creditors from taking action to collect against the debtor without obtaining Order of the court, uh, order of the bankruptcy court. If a company has liens on its accounts receivables or inventory, it's going to need to get permission to continue to use the secured creditors, uh, the proceeds from the liquidation of these assets, in order to continue to operate the business. But for the most part, creditors wanting to take action have to apply to the bankruptcy court for relief. The goal of the chapter 11 is to propose and confirm a plan of reorganization. The plan of reorganization will say, how are we going to repay our existing debts? And you generally divide creditors into classes. One class consists of priority claims, which are primarily tax claims. Another category, each creditor who has a lien against assets is treated as a separate class of creditors. The bankruptcy code in dealing with secured claims has one thing that's very important to understand. A creditor, normally if, if you had a creditor with a lien on a vehicle, they are a secured by the vehicle to the, for as much as they're owed on the vehicle. In bankruptcy, secured claims are, are deemed secured only to the extent of the value of the collateral. If a car is secured by a $20,000 lien and the car is worth $10,000, the bankruptcy code would only treat that secured creditor secured to the extent of $10,000 the balance is an unsecured claim. And the reason that's important, because under the plan, secured creditors are entitled to be paid in full with a reasonable interest rate. Unsecured, uh, going back generally, tax claims are paid in full over time. In expenses related to the bankruptcy, these post-petition liabilities also have to be paid. Unsecured creditors get treated a different way. Unsecured creditors, you normally see a plan treat them one of three ways. They're either paid over time, they're paid a percentage of the debt when you emerge from bankruptcy, or the most common treatment is for creditors to be paid 
a percentage of their claim over time. The problem with chapters 11 is it can be an expensive and lengthy process. In order to expedite chapter 11 cases and make them more user-friendly, as part of the CARES Act, there was an, an increase in the ability to use a part of chapter 11, what they call subchapter five. In subchapter five, what it says is there's a couple of advantages. One, you, you don't have to pay US trustee fees. So the costs are lower. Secondly, only a debtor can file a plan. In, in a chapter 11 case, this case goes on, the creditor, may, uh, other creditors may be able to file a plan. The trade-off from this only being, only the debtor can pay, file a plan is the plan has to be filed within the first 90 days of the case. But probably the most important distinction between a chapter 11 and the chapter five, in a chapter 11 case, the creditors are given the chance to vote and you need to get some creditor support in order to confirm a plan. Subchapter five doesn't require any acceptance by creditors and the, the court can confirm a plan if they find the plan is fair and creditors are getting and and creditors are receiving uh, the full the disposable disposable revenues or excess revenues being generated by a debtor over five years the life of the plan. One of the things to talk about claims and liabilities. Uh, the bankruptcy code defines claims very broadly. The purpose of it is to try to bring as many types of obligations, liabilities into the bankruptcy case so that when the debtor can emerges, it can get it can it can get a broader discharge. A, it can, it can say that it has put as many of these liabilities claims and can proceed forward in paying these under the plan. There are some claims that are capped. If we have people who are trying to get out of leases and trying to move a leases and you reject the lease, rather than being, being saddled with years and years of liabilities, the bankruptcy code would cap those claims at one year. Important, important thing when you talk to small businesses, most small businesses owners, when they get credit, are going to have to guarantee debts. The Chapter 11 does not stay action against guarantors. If a bankruptcy is filed, there needs to be some discussion about whether they can get relief to protect the, the guarantors, but more likely you'll see the guarantors filing their camp companion cases. Uh, some, some entities have gotten PPP loans or other government subsidies. Uh, those is, is, we're seeing those work through the system. Most people view the PPP loans or government subsidies as pre-petition claims that are included in this broad bucket of claims and liabilities that are addressed as pre-petition indebtedness in a bankruptcy. One of the issues under the current PPP loans is the SBA guidelines do not pr provide that a debtor in bankruptcy is not entitled to participate in these loans. Other government subsidies don't have that restriction, but there needs to be some analysis of applying for these subsidies as to whether the filing of a bankruptcy will cause you not to be included in, in, the, type, in, in the category of parties entitled to participate in these benefits. There, other questions about 
whether if you get the PPP loan or other government subsidies and file bankruptcy, whether that impacts the forgiveness. Uh, those are working their way through courts. and We don't have a final, a final uh, decision, but I would say, you know, if you need to file bankruptcy and you have a government subsidy uh, or PPP loan, you just have to, to deal with that because you have to deal with it as a pre-petition claim because ultimately you're making the decision that the bankruptcy is what's necessary to continue to save the business. Okay. Um, so um, it sounds like this is a really uh, important um, option for small businesses and certainly one that would you recommend, Scott, that they get uh, legal advice before they take any action? Yeah, well, I think first of all, for most companies, you have to, you can only act through counsel. Secondly, uh, I think normally if you're considering, if you're asking the question, should I file bankruptcy? I think you need to sit down with somebody who's knowledgeable in the area who can advise you of the pros and cons. I've always told clients that bankruptcy is not a great place to be, but you got to compare it to be where you'd be without filing. If you're having your landlord terminating your lease, unless you file, if you're having the bank uh, not providing you access to funds, unless you file, those those are important. Those are important issues that need to be discussed, and bankruptcy may be the only way that can keep your company alive. So bankruptcy may be the ultimate decision, but uh, businesses and, and nonprofits, they need to be looking to get the answers to the questions about how to avoid it before they are in need of the service. Does that sound about right? Yeah, I'd say avoid it or, you know, be able to talk with a professional. What are the pros and cons? So, so if you make the decision either to file or not file, it is based, it's an informed decision based on information being provided by a professional knowledgeable in the area. Very good. Um, okay, so I appreciate that information, Scott. I know this is uh, something that people need to know more about and um, hopefully they'll be able to ask the right questions. There are, um, is this uh, specifically something to Florida or is this available to um, small businesses and nonprofits nationwide? Well, you know, the bankruptcy is a federal law, so it is available. So bankruptcy relief is available to uh, companies throughout throughout the country. There, we talked briefly about this assignment for the benefit of creditors. That is a state-specific remedy, and that varies, very, varies greatly from state to state. Very good. Um, I'm having some technological issues here, so I apologize. Hopefully everyone can hear me. All right, so thank you again. I do appreciate it. Both of our speakers uh, and um, Representative Castor do appreciate your participating today. So Paul, would you switch to the next screen? Again, I wanna remind everyone, the Florida Community Development Legal Project, it is a statewide project. So no matter what community you are in Florida, you should definitely go to our website you can see the website information on the screen. And then you can also see that we do have a special area on the FCDL website for legal assistance related to COVID-19. So please do not hesitate to access these services. Um, and I also want to, Paul, if you'll switch to the next slide. I also want to remind you that the Judge Don Castor Community Law Center is your, um, is your resource for organizations, nonprofits, and small businesses in Hillsborough, Pasco, Pinellas, Sarasota, and Manatee counties. You can apply directly for services on our website at Bay Area, www.balf.org. Look for the Judge John Castor Community Law Center, or we also have a link that says nonprofits and small businesses. We want to be there to answer your questions and to give you extended services if that's what you need. Um, please feel free to log in and also look for the COVID links on our website. And I do wanna let you know that this project is volunteer based and it would be remiss for me if I didn't um, 
tell you that we do have the support of volunteer attorneys, not only in the Tampa Bay area, but throughout the state of Florida. The attorneys with the business, the Florida Bar Business Law Section and other sections that are related to the, uh, to the issues that are involved with our community. They are uh, there to support us and to support you. So please, if you need the assistance, um, I want to encourage you to call. And Paul, if you want to switch to the last screen, um, please, if you haven't watched today and you're listening or you know someone who needs this information, uh, the replay of our program is going to be available on Bay Area's uh, Facebook. It's on demand. So if you know someone who needs this information, uh, hatch, send them to our Facebook. And if anyone needs our assistance, please send them to me or send them to Florida Community Development Legal Project. Again, thank you to all of our presenters today. And I wanna uh, thank Paul. He's been our moderator today. So thank you, Paul, and um, have a very safe and, and happy weekend. Thank you.